I now have the privilege of introducing the panelist, Mr. Deepak Shanoi. Deepak is the founder and CEO of Capital Mind, a premium wealth advisory firm. He brings over two decades of experience in financial markets from stocks to bonds to options and algorithmic trading. He was one of the first people in India to start an algorithmic trading firm back in 2009. He co-founded two startups, Agni Software and Money Yoga, before launching Capital Mind in 2010. Being a well-recognized research analyst, Deepak is frequently featured on CNBC TV 18 and ET Now, and also writes in Mint. Deepak has recently launched his first book called Money Wise, which talks about building wealth by investing. The book takes you through a journey about how to grow your money by investing, the pitfalls, and the things to watch out for. Congratulations, Deepak, on the launch of your book. And thank you for being a part of today's panel discussion. Uh, our next panelist is Mr. Vamsi Madhav. He's the Chief Operating Officer at Sehmati, an industry alliance for account aggregator ecosystem. He's a seasoned professional in software product management with tremendous experience in mobile financial solutions. He has been hands-on in complete innovation lifecycle on the AA platform from ideation to launch for complex enterprise-wide software. Evangelizing technology to C-level executives across cultures and industries has been his strength. He's highly analytical with deep interest in technology management. His experience includes his career spanning 24 years and counting has been associated with Asian Paints, iLabs Private Limited, Vsoft, Sumeru Solutions, and Comviva, to name a few. We are very happy to have you in our midst today, and we look forward to hearing your views. The next on our panel is Mr. Anand Datta. Anand is a principal at Nexus Venture Partners. He's passionate about helping entrepreneurs build high-impact enterprises in fintech, insurtech, education, and logistics. With a background in operations at high-growth companies, Anand is keen to help startups with his experience. He believes in the immense scope that Bharat presents for innovative India-specific models. Anand was an entrepreneur and business leader prior to joining Nexus. He was a founding team member of Magic Pin. Most recently, he was heading new market PNL and growth across Asia for Beamer a global insurtech company. Previously, Anand worked with Bain & Co as, as a strategy consultant. Thank you, Anand, and we're eager to hear your views. I now request the panelists to please come on stage. The moderator for this panel discussion, Mr. Tejinder Pal Manchanda, Chief Business Officer, Cam Spencer. Tejinder is responsible for design and execution of the overarching business strategy of the company and has been associated with Cam's since February 2020. And after this uh, great uh, presentation by Sumindu and a welcome note by Sharat, I think we would want to take up this uh, discussion on how to really get the most out of the account aggregator ecosystem. So um, I, we have a few questions around it. And uh, uh, maybe I'll first take a question with Anand. You. So you know, the setting the context, you know, we have close to about, let's say, three and a half crore mutual fund investors in the country. We have close to about 10 crore demand accounts. And this number has seen a, a two and a half time growth in the last two and a half years itself. And uh, about 40% growth in the same time frame on the investor side. I mean, you say there's an uh, explosive growth which is happening. But even after all of that, India has yet to have less than 10 crore, you know, uh, and less than 10% of its country under, you know, having access to, you know, financial markets. So question that comes to our mind is, you know, can the account aggregator ecosystem, you know, help us take this uh, number, get in an additional 10 crore investors. And uh, while that is happening, you know, how would the financialization of saving, you know, over the, uh, the next few years would help, uh, you know, break the silos of, you know, uh, various ecosystems of this, you know, uh, setups? No, absolutely. It's an interesting question and interesting dynamics that been happening in the ecosystem of late, right? That uh, entire growth of DMAT account, if you see, it's actually a literally a hockey stick growth, like in terms of how much has been added. Partly because of uh, demography as well, we have a young demography moving, want access to new types of investment. Uh, it it's definitely is more active than passive, like there is obviously a debate over there, but that's happening. But if we look at the drivers, what has driven it? Like I think, in my mind at least, there are three drivers to it. One is the trust, second is attractiveness, and third is ease of uh, doing it. And we shall see how account aggregator sort of impacts that. Like if you see trust, if I go back to my parents' generation, right, when there was no DMAT account and all, there was a lot of lack of trust on stock and why real estate or gold or let's say other things were more prevalent, even insurance as a 
uh, saving option, which is still a very large portion of the saving bucket. It was just because purely there was much higher trust. A lot of this with this campaign around mutual fund sahi hai or demat dematerialization and a lot of role played by camps also uh, has created this trust. Uh, attractiveness is genuinely there because of inflation as well as uh, uh, how much return the savings are given. Uh, but beyond that also what has happened which is the ease of operating which has played into both the trust and attract attractiveness. How, how it has done so is like now you can you know, put money in stocks, put money in mutual funds and withdraw money from stocks and withdraw money from mutual fund very easily. You can access how much, how that is doing very easily. All this has been enabled by the digital uh, innovation that has happened in the, in the country right now. I think account aggregators surely will be a force multiplier over there. There will be a one, first degree effect, there are second degree effects also. I'll, quote two examples of first degree and the second degree effects probably. The first degree effect is very simply put the ease of operation, what uh, Shomendu was showing, right? You know, how do you pull data? There is a lot of fall from the funnel during the KYC process. There is a lot of fall uh, through the funnel during, you know, like uh, bank account verification, a lot of uh, physical uh, things that happens over there. Just purely because of that, I will believe that people who want to get onboarded onto doing mutual fund, their first trial to gain the trust that this thing works, this is not some pokey pokey thing out there, that thing will get, get much, much more accentuated. This is, at the very base, the first degree impact that will happen. The second degree impact is more around the attractiveness of this, uh, this uh, option. Some bit from advisory, where if I can look at right now, what happens is who is our advisors? Like obviously there are the Deepak Shinoi's of the world, but there are also the neighborhood uncles of the world, where most of the other generation in tier two, tier three, they just go and say, Kicha bhai, kis mein paise dale? And then they say that insurance mein dal do, is mein dal do. Versus if that segment can be tapped and shown that, hey, you have put money in a endowment plan, which is giving you probably six and a half percent, and then that's probably 80% of your corpus versus where you should be actually putting money. That, that can change the dynamics. Secondly, what will happen is that, and then this is probably a third degree impact, is that mutual fund, right now if you see why is gold such a popular uh, avenue to put money. Gold can be put as a mortgage, it can be pledged, and you can take a loan, and you can very easily take this thing. Now there are aspects where I can look into your account, and for example, take example of one card, 40% of one card is being distributed by uh, secured cards on FDs. Now if I can just have a view on what all mutual funds you have, what all stocks you are holding, you can pledge that I can give you a credit card against that. That makes for me a mutual fund and this as a very, or, or working capital loan for that matter, because loan against property yeah. for the SMBs is a very popular category. That makes mutual fund a much, much more, uh, you know, attractive segment for me to put money on that. So absolutely. all this first, second, third degree impact, I'll see that uh, will make it a force. Absolutely. Impact. In fact, uh, the second degree impact that you're talking here actually takes me to the question that I had in my mind for Deepak. You know, the you know, account aggregator platform is, will be able to give us a 360 degree view of the customer, you know, in terms of uh, his financial assets across banking data, capital market data, insurance, uh, and NPS. Now, uh, this will finally enable financial advisors to give an accurate and updated uh, digital information. And then, uh, you know, the question that comes to our mind is, do you think this account aggregator uh, platform can really democratize the wealth management? And uh, how would this help fintechs and uh, digitally savvy uh, incumbents of uh, things like robo-advisories? Uh, this is a very good question because I think the answer is not entirely complete right now. So one of the down, uh, the problems with the financial uh, the current situation of the ag aggregator system is you get data only for roughly a year. But we all have investing journeys that have lasted many years. And to give you proper financial advice, uh, you not only know, need to know where you are, but you need to know how you got here. Uh, uh, there's a difference because I, I may find you at the bottom of a valley. I, uh, I will give you a different, uh, 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 a different piece or, and I might give you a different treatment if you have walked into the valley from outside versus if you've rolled down the hill. Okay. Uh, so you need sometimes information on uh, how your investments have been over the last uh, few years. Uh, we found some interesting use cases as a wealth uh, uh, management business also. For instance, uh, we've helped people discover how rich they are. Uh, this is a 
fortunate thing because many people have invested over their lifetimes. Yeah, a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can almost guarantee you that if you've been in this in the in the business for a while, you'll have money you don't you didn't know about. I had money I didn't know about and find an account statement, go to NSDL and find an account statement. People are like, I don't have this. No, no, you do. You do have this. This is your money. <laughs> oh, very good. You know, so so uh, we've helped uh, we've helped people uh, become richer when they were alive. Uh, at some point, that's a good thing. Uh, an account aggregator will actually seamlessly do this without pe needing people like Deepak Shanoi to have to go to uh, different sites and enable this. We were, Actually, in an in, in unfortunate situation, and perhaps COVID has accelerated this phenomenon, is uh, sometimes people pass away suddenly. And we've actually helped people, the relatives, because pe you know when people invest, they don't tell their near and dear ones where they've invested. After a while, if someone has to suddenly pass, uh, the next of kin finds it difficult to just figure out where all these things are. Uh, we've had to do crazy things just to find out how people, uh, how many bank accounts or where bank accounts are. You read SMSs, you download tools that read your SMSs. Acha, shy this bank my account hai. And then you go and find out from some UPI application, ki acha, isma, account has a root. And all of these things can actually get sorted. These are not even use cases that you might see because they're not, you know, but they're actually very useful use cases because, uh, you know, it, it helps people. And it, it solves a real problem. Um, the other part of wealth management, and, and I know that it's probably not uh, useful enough because we are dealing with HNIs to a large part, but at the absolute bottom end of the spectrum, uh, people are not treated very well by financial institutions when they meet face to face. Mm -hmm. So anything that's digital can actually uh, save them a lot of trouble. Uh, there's a reason why people go to a branch of a Muthoot or a Manapuram and pledge their gold at 29% interest rates yeah. versus going to a State Bank of India and taking the same loan at 6%. Because in the State Bank of, if you've ever gone uh, to in the morning, early morning to watch how people who don't have as much income as, as many of us do uh, are treated in a branch, you'll notice why they would rather prefer a place where they're treated better, yeah. even if they had to pay a much higher interest rate. And I think digital parts of this process will ease a lot, not just from the lending and borrowing perspective, but some of these people will actually go on to build great financial lives themselves. They will become rich uh, just by the, the course of financialization of India. And I think that we ignore how big that can be. Yeah. Uh, we've always been like one, two, three city country. But most of what's going to come in the next 20 years will not be in these three, will be partly in these three cities because uh, I live here, so I would like it to be part of it. <laughs> but a lot of it will come from outside, will come from places that are not Bangalore, Bombay, and Delhi. Uh, and for that to happen, you're going to need things like the account aggregator system. And honestly, I'm enthused about it because as a person in this space, I would like you know, a lot more people to invest, a lot more people to want to invest, and a lot more people to have the money to be able to invest. Mm -hmm. and I think that's what's going to create all of the... Uh, so, well said. So, in fact, uh, that takes me to the, you know, fact that, you know, getting rich may not have been the real objective for Government of India to be, you know, push, pushing this agenda. But, you know, we have seen, you know, Government of India has been very vocal supporter, more from, let's say, you know, financial inclusion perspective and, you know, the obvious benefits that a platform will provide. And we have seen extremely positive commentary from you know all the regulators about you know onboarding on the AA platform, with all regulations coming up and all of them. So, however, we still see some kind of reluctance from several incumbents in participating in this ecosystem in a true spirit, you know, just beyond a tick mark activity. So, the, what I call, my question to you, Vamsi, would be, you know, what are the key challenges, uh, you know, according to you, which are coming in the way of AA adoption, and how Samathi can really, you know, enable it. So, uh, you know, one of the things that I have learned uh, during the course of the last few years is that um, this um, reluctance that we see, and we are very angsty about it, actually there is a pattern. I mean, I've heard stories from Sharad about UPI, um, Aadhaar, when the bureaus came in. Yeah. Uh, and it's not just in India. I have a friend who is the CMO of one of the largest banks in Australia. I was talking to her about how open banking in Australia is happening, and nothing has moved. 
in the in the big banks right so yet many of these are success stories we tout today aadhar upi etc so i think the lesson there is that you know this is a pattern if anything perhaps we are in good company right if there was reluctance and we found a playbook to sort of overcome it i think it's in the nature of things that um, and there are good things that are that we are seeing coming out of this reluctance because you know if everybody suddenly follows the same narrative then perhaps there is something wrong you need people to sort of call out caution you need people to also sort of uh, particularly the largest institutions are very honestly uh, concerned about whether this will create a wild wild west of data right uh, yes half of it is rooted in ignorance of the actual Uh, security rails and the tech rails etc but the other half of it comes from deep experience that you know however much one builds in uh, god like tech there is always somebody who is looking to hack it so i think i think there is a certain pace of doing things we may always look back and say why did it take 5 years etc i think it will take another 5 years but we are in the right direction and therefore i think patience is required that's number one the second point and i'll come to the question around you know what can we do therefore are we should we just sit and say yes it's in the nature of things and do nothing obviously not right uh, but the second point also is a lot of these rails are built with you know keeping what's fundamentally right which is great uh, what is useful for the citizen agency and control etc etc but the economic incentives for market players to adopt it are left to the market right um and i think that's taking time because i think there is always this um, very obvious benefit to one side of the market you know in terms of roi etc etc which is immediate short term easily perceptible but it takes some amount of visioning for people who are incumbents to say yes if we don't do this so the narrative all you know as always is like deepak was saying you know, speaking outside is there is a fear narrative that one can put in saying mar jaoge agar nahi karoge to right but that can only go so far the other side of the narrative is look how this has helped you you know uh, build new use cases or look how the playbook of say uh, the bureaus has actually helped the largest lenders become more powerful so some of these i think take time for you know the logic to sort of be accepted the good news the good news i think is that today we are not in a uh, situation where the narrative is why should we do it i think the good news is thanks to what you said about the government pushing it the regulators all the nudges i think anuj spoke about multiple nudges at different yeah. places so all of that so what can sarmati do to enable it i think you know I, i really enjoyed the way sharad put the whole notion of um i think and this is something that we are seeing i think um you know doing the right thing in terms of recognizing that there are two sides to everything coming up with codes of conduct for example economic incentives is a classic question right i mean who will solve it yeah. i think slowly we are seeing the mindset also change slowly but uh, or of waiting for somebody from a compliance angle come and give the solution right and in fact we are living that whole thing i'm personally also sort of this is new and and enjoyable to actually be in a land where there is no circular that somebody can read and implement on several of these matters in fact very unique regulatory sort of landscape for account aggregation even unlike upi upi has a statutory authority called npci which is god yeah. right yeah. in account aggregation actually there is nobody if you go to rbi rbi is basically saying we've left it to the market so i think sarmati's role is to bring in you know um, you know what in my mind i call samvad a dialogue of people who firstly we must you know sort of uh, expect will behave in a mature fashion not in a fashion where you covet and do land grab all the time right and and these mindsets take time the you know the the older the institution the longer it takes right the younger the institution the easier it is but i think we are finding that slowly but surely codes of conduct are emerging from the community and i think when they emerge from the community the adherence to it actually is much easier because then you are no longer fighting or doing the minimum required and so on and so forth so i think whether it's in data governance economic incentives etc sarmati's role will be to bring in you know uh, suggestions from the ecosystem for that thank you 
In fact, uh, let me just uh, pick it up to the next level of, you know, the UPI story which is being discussed over here. You know, it's a well-known story of, of UPI and, you know, most of us immediately think of UPI adoption as a benchmark for AA, so to say. And uh, how, unlike UPI, as you said, you know, AA is neither mandatory nor does it have a common infrastructure provider like NPCI, as you mentioned. So, uh, uh, how, how do you see the adoption of AA versus UPI over the next few years? Yeah, it's like, uh, you know, like when UPI started, maybe it was, maybe at the first level before Demon, it was good to have. Like, okay, there are multiple other IMPS and, and now it is a must have. What I can see in future, AA also will go through that journey. It will probably have, give advantage to some people initially, where they are able to better underwrite, they are able to better advise, they are able to better this thing. But I was actually, for this, I was talking to a bunch of startups, like with the grown ones also, like that, how are they looking into AAs just, just before this, uh, this panel discussion also. Everyone is predicting that in probably, if, if the data and what we are talking about, if all the parties on the FIU side come, and if the data starts coming in the flow which is it is expected to be, it will become a table stake. Like there will be no fintech or financial services which will have a flow without an account aggregator because it's so powerful, right? Like if you, there is, let's say there is an advisor who can look at my 360 degree view and tell me what to do. Why will I ever go to any other advisor which doesn't have this data access or it, it cannot give me that? If there is a lender who can give me, you know, loan on the basis of my flow, Versus there are people who are saying that I'm going to only interact you based on your civil score. My civil score could have been screwed. Like when I moved back from the US to India, I was not like I wanted to take a house loan. I was not offered a house loan in, in spite of me being in a certain salary back bracket and everything. So why will I ever go to that lender? So all this being made together, if how the structure is coming about, if it comes through, it will not be a matter of if or this will happen, it will become a hygiene or a table stake and they will, that adoption will have to happen. So that's, that's pretty clear. In fact, you know, while you're saying adoption, you know, uh, uh, Deepak, you know, I would want to really hear from you. you know, what do you think TSPs or AI like us can you know, do to fast track the adoption even more when your demands would be important for us to hear? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I, can, I can spend the whole evening on this. It's just uh, crazy. But you see, the way I think about this is AA is like uh, uh, pretty much an all or nothing ecosystem. So if you give me five banks ka data, it's not useful. The minute you get every bank in, it becomes 100x more useful. When you bring in the mutual funds and the uh, NSDL and CDSL in, it becomes another 10x more useful. Now the reason for this is very complex, but I think what it creates is a whole generation of uh, credit, which India has uh, struggled with. India is largely a gated economy. You get into the gate and then what happens inside the gate is not, nobody cares about it. Right? So it's no more like, give me your current bank statement, I will then give you a loan. Whose current bank statement ke baad, if you have taken out all the money, yeah. it is not relevant anymore. And that's what happens, people, uh, you know. So the difference between that and a flow-based lending economy is I don't need to know your bank account statement today. I will, of course, use it. But if tomorrow you take the money out, I will still be able to know this. If you give me access to the, the the way that your information flows, I will, for the genuine people, actually be able to give you much more credit. Now, what UPI has done is made every shopkeeper a potential working capital recipient, which they have never been able to get. You know, it's it's uh, kacha lending is at two percent to three percent a month, mm -hmm. uh, versus a bank would love to give even one and a half percent a month, and it's it will significantly reduce. Ca but the problem with the bank or the financial institution has been that these people deal deal in cash. Now they don't. They have a GST number. GST is coming into account aggregator. They have a bank account. The bank account is an ag account aggregator. Match the flows. Match the GST, and you suddenly have uh, potentially. I don't know, even five or 10 crore more people that you could lend to. These people, as they, uh, a large amount of the uh, retail economy is uh, based on working capital. I am constrained by the amount of money I have in order to be able to st uh, keep my shop uh, uh, full of goods. Uh, to a certain extent, therefore, I have to depend on the credit of somebody else. If I didn't have to, I would stock only the stuff that I, I would have and therefore increase my profits and capital and so on. This part is simply not there. So 
we are actually going to see the evolution of this in a much, much larger way than we have ever imagined. Uh, and every bank, unfortunately or fortunately, will, and every financial lending institution will have to be part of this ecosystem. They will all be eventually saying, your current bank statement is not going to be enough. If you guys want greater and greater credit, starting from the 10,000 rupees to the 10 lakh rupees, or how much ever you want it, uh, it's the flow-based lending that will change, uh, that, will, that we, everybody will change to. I think this is what we've got to facilitate, but you've got to put barriers in place that ensure that this data is not misused, abused, and therefore um, does not create uh, political dissent, because eventually this is people that we're dealing with, people who have a lot less information than people sitting in financial uh, ivory towers like me have. You know, no, we, we sit and we pronounce judgment on X number of things, but we should not be allowed to at some level. But having those barriers, uh, 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 creates the, you know, a democratization of, of credit, if you may. Uh, my demand will, you know, if I start today, I'll end tomorrow morning. But uh, <laughs> I think the basic uh, structure of this is we have to have a good redressal mechanism uh, when con consent is misused. We have to have a good uh, mechanism to withdraw consent many, many days after it is given. So regard, like you can now uh, deny your credit card auto yeah. pay wala things. Uh, independent of the website in which you actually registered your, your con you, you need to be able to, I mean, I think AA enables that, which is fantastic. It's just that this information has to be made prominent. It can't be hidden away in one tiny terms and conditions, also withdraw consent, you know, that wala thing. So all these things are also important, I think. Um, but this is a game changer. I mean, yeah. it, it will change it probably from next year onwards because the data isn't here yet. I'd love to see it, and I I uh, am looking forward to it quite quite yeah. meaningfully. Yes. So we, I we suppose, thank you for raising the demand in, in that sense. Actually, you know, while adoption is being discussed, you know, Vamsi, we can't let you away from the question around it because you know, customer awareness and adoption is a make or break for this ecosystem. You know, so and uh, how should the AA industry go about addressing concerns about data privacy and leakages? has been discussed by Deepak, or how do you see regulation uh, evolving around data security, given the sensitive nature of the data? Now, uh, all FIUs, you know, uh, though regulated, you know, may not have the same level of, you know, uh, controls. So, you know, I think there are, uh, if you look at two constituencies that need to sort of um, uh, drive adoption, citizens, of course, is, you know, the, the end state, but before that, participants and influencers in institutions that understand you know what's under the hood and etc cetera, etc cetera, right i think um, firstly there is perhaps a greater need and we keep doing a lot of this but it is never enough of explanation of what the rails uh, are made of right um, and i think you know in a lot of the the public messaging, often the one that takes center stage is the narrative of convenience. And fair enough, because that's really what, you know, is easiest for people to understand, even the practitioners, right? Yeah. I mean, even when Shomindu presented, obviously is extremely focused on what I think all of us now in the, in the product world, have, you know, the number of, you know, interactions and clicks and all of that fine tuning. But really, a lot of this is not meant for that. It is actually meant for you know, the DEPA acronym has protection embedded in it. Now, how does protection happen? What does protection even mean? So, we don't have enough knowledge about how security is implemented here, right? Okay. Um, the good news is that uh, a lot of these terms, maybe five, seven years ago, ten years ago, these non-functional terms were in the ivory towers of the tech folks. Today we see policy makers. I mean, a simple term called an API is heard in government circles. I mean, can you even imagine that, you know, being there a few years ago? So, and you know, we've interacted with policy makers who are extremely bright, surprisingly, in terms of, you know, I mean, I didn't mean that that way. What I meant is uh, extremely bright, surprisingly, on the topic of, you know, uh, of tech. So this whole public policy plus public goods mission that Sharad spoke about is also actually resulting in um, different segments of society becoming more aware, right? And so that will percolate and we and you on your part, I think have to do a lot of this 
demystifying of what security is, what privacy is. I mean, WhatsApp actually strangely did that yeah. for us, you know, <laughs> not necessarily in the right way, but we all suddenly are aware of what it means to, you know, have a conversation which is encrypted. What does it even mean? Yeah. So I think we have to do a lot of that. That's number one, right? For practitioners, I'm saying. Um, number two is, I think, aspects around grievance redressal and mechanisms of uh, what happens if something goes wrong. I think it's been a very strange evolution, right? I mean, the bill is getting passed in parliament now, yeah. but the regulator came out with something five years ago and the market has already implemented before the bill has come. I mean, this is all, all kinds of stuff, but this is India. I mean, I think somehow we will make it happen. I think it will now become very streamlined because now with the bill coming in, you will suddenly see a whole litany of formal education and people making business out of it. It will all help us. Okay. Because now suddenly people will say consent management, ah, oh, account aggregator is sub-secure. Hai. You know, so there is law, there is regulation, etc., etc. Right? So I think now this will be the second for practitioners. Right? As far as citizens are concerned, and we've been doing a lot of work in working groups, I think trust markers. For example, it's wonderful that account aggregators are actually licensed by RBI. Because all that one needs to say is RBI licensed. Oh, RBI can amate, you know, there is trust, right? So I think the building blocks are in place. Obviously, we needed, you know, not to put the card before the horse. You can't go to town like Deepak say, said, you know, saying account aggregator is here if my <laughs> damn bank is not on the, you know, on, on the network. Now we have all the public sector banks. In six months, we will have all the other institutions coming in. So I think now the wave of sort of, uh, you know, taking it to citizens in a very easy way. Um, and, and new challenges will, will happen. For example, UPI, everybody understands the brand UPI, right? I mean, maybe people don't even know the acronym, but they know what it means. Now, what do we call A? Do we continue to call it A? And maybe we will, because I think you know, a few years, couple of years ago, we were all debating on what should the brand name be. I think, oh, you know, Gadi Nikal Chuka Hai Abhi, right? So, <laughs> so now we will just evangelize it as A and it's got a nice ring to it. Uh, some people will still crib about whether one should call it double A, A, you know, what is his account <laughs> aggregator. Is so, I think citizen messaging uh, will now happen. Um, primarily, it will be around the fact that there is a trusted body called RBI which is overseeing this whole thing. Beyond that, I don't think the mass of citizens will care much about it. They will really care about it when they have an issue and then the proof of grievance redressal will come in. And I think the good news is that all the four regulators, and we are in touch with them at different stages as, as are all of you. I think there's a lot of support for how um, the community is thinking about grievance redressal. For example, the whole notion of ODR, you know, as this newest thing, it's finding a lot of support saying that you know, let's not load the ombudsman or uh, consumer forums or the courts. We need a new way of even looking at grievance redressal. And in account aggregator, we are taking steps to sort of embed it natively. So for citizens, I think just, you know, RBI-led stuff, uh, messaging happening from policymakers as well as account aggregators saying now it's time for you to use it and proof that grievance redressals are there in place when an adverse event happens, that will take care of a lot of the adoption. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mamsi. In fact, you covered a lot of aspects in this con discussion. We covered many of my questions, we got answered as it is. Sorry about so, that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, I have to ask one question which is very dear to me. In fact, you know, sitting in the audience here, for Bangalore has a very unique culture of fintech and collaborations, and it's India's Silicon Valley. So the evolution of AI ecosystems actually is very closely linked to the advent of new use cases, discussions, a lot of around it. You know, maybe any of you, all of you can take this question. What role you think you know, Namma Bengaluru can play in that regard? Uh, should I? Oh, well, <laughs> I guess. Um, so I didn't know this for a while, but Bangalore, Bangalore was not a, is not a metro. Uh, but still, it's the number three. Uh, city in the country uh, in terms of amount of money that sits in account, savings accounts in, in India. Uh, but we still have the worst roads of the country. Okay? So it's just like probably just one of those snafus which kind of happens. But what happens with this, uh, I mean, it, it actually means we are more bothered 
with the money that we have than the infrastructure that the money can build. But it also means perhaps that we can do. Uh, brain power as well. Yeah, um, <laughs> well, it, that that's so interestingly. I think uh, uh, the the uh, the power of technology and money is kind of being demonstrated right now with UPI being as ubiquitous as it, as it is and all that. The account. Uh, so in general, I think uh, uh, the concept of the account aggregator and the you know the ability to use this. We might actually see a large amount of it being demonstrated in uh, or initiated in Bangalore and then spread across the country simply because we have two things that Bangalorean and I, I'm, an, I'm an old Bangalorean so in a way I can say this, we, we probably don't care as much about our privacy as, as most other people so we'll very happily give our OTPs and say <laughs> <laughs> what happens next that's, that's uh, so we will not we will I, I mean it's just that people in other places are a little more scared Achha, he'll see all my bank accounts yeah. he'll be like Haan, see what's the big deal right first of all I don't probably have that much and worst case what will you do you can't take it away from me anyways so uh, at that but the second part of the adoption curve is that um, we will find use cases from bank, from bank, maybe from India in general, that I don't think anybody in this room has currently ever imagined before. Because uh, like Sharad said, when they sent the U GPS satellites in the air, they didn't think it would build an Uber. But somebody built it. And AA is just infrastructure. What comes on top of it is going to be in, in the head of us. Yeah, I mean, it's like one unique thing that I've seen, at least in India, is like I'm going taking one step back is when I was in Southeast Asia or US, our financial and digital infrastructure has leapfrogged the other company, countries by way. Like whatever our physical infrastructure, especially in Bangalore is, but whatever our digital infrastructure has leapfrogged. You talk about payment in US, we are still working in ACH world where we are talking about immediate payments here in India. The closest to account aggregated in US is probably played in a certain way, if you, and they are working on scraping technology. They are, take your login, think about consent and others. You'll take your login, scrape your data, and give the data for you. But if you think about UPI again, UPI happened through Google Pays and the phone pays of the world. Without that participation from technology, this is finally we are talking about information technology only. We are talking about data being shared. That cannot happen without the tech or the tech innovation, what we are talking about as the public and the private tech working hand in hand. Frankly, if you ask me, I don't care whether it happens from Bangalore or not. As long as it happens in India, whether it happens remotely, it happens people sitting in Madhya Pradesh, it happens sitting people sitting in Bihar, it happens people sitting in Delhi. This thing. As long as we keep leapfrogging this, the way it can democratize and the impact it can happen uh, all over India in what companies across India can do and what people in India can get, it's, it's, a, it's a very different impact. Great, great, and in fact, thank you for this word of confidence about the Bangalore city. Maybe Vamsi want to add something about that? No, I just want to add that uh, all of these, we were discussing this, all these open digital environments yeah. um, actually tend to make technology service providers force multipliers. Yeah. Because, you know, UPI, for example, you know, we've all heard of JustPay, for example, as a company that powers so many, you know, and so they are, and I think the more these open digital environments come in, all these acronyms, ONDC, OKEN, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, suddenly all the regulated entities are saying, I need somebody who understands all of this, right? <laughs> and then add to that things like what folks like Sarmati and all of these people say, which is, oh, you've got to have certification, you've got to have this and that. So actually, TSPs become focal points, force multipliers, and what better place than Bangalore for, for that, right? So Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. It's been a great uh, so conversation. Much. I hope audience had uh, a few takeaways from it. And uh, we'll uh, move. I think